So the last thing that we had discussed uh, as we finished last time was the I type format in the context of instruction formats. So I'm going to uh, proceed today with an example of how C code could be used um, or how the I type instruction could be used to implement a, uh, a line of C code, a statement of C code um, in um, at an assembly level. So let's say that we have, um, I want the uh, member Teddy of array A to be equal to H, so some uh, number, and that plus that member before being updated plus the number one. And remember the, the, that the I type uh, are very useful with um, to implement uh, operations uh, with uh, small constants, relatively small constants. Also, let's further assume that um, the array uh, an H uses uh, registers 10 and 21 respectively. And we're also going to use a temporary register um, X9. So we're going to use X9 as a temporary register. So first, remember that all interaction uh, with memory is through loads and stores. So we're going to uh, we're going to load that member of the array into register nine. So from your familiarity with the load instruction and that specific uh, relative addressing mode, you know that X10 is going to contain the pointer of A, so basically the address of the first member. And if we want member Teddy, we have to multiply that times eight because you know that we are, or it's a reasonable assumption to say that we are dealing with um, integers and these are 64 bit integers that take eight bytes. And the address is in bytes. So we want what is the first byte of A Teddy. And that's what we get, and we load that into register 9. Okay? And the instruction would look like this. So this would be that D type instruction. So you can see the fields in the top. So we have here. The one in the uh, top here are applicable to the R type, but the ones here at the bottom of these two columns are applicable to the D type. So here we have the address, displacement, okay, the opcode, the register source, and the destination register. So that's the actual numbers that we would encode the instruction in binary if we wrote the, the ones and zeros uh, for the 32-bit uh, instruction. Then we said that H was in register 21. So here we're just adding 9, which is really A30, to H. And we're going to overwrite register 9 with the, the result. So that would be the opcode. So here we have first source, second source, and destination. Then we could do an add immediate to add the one. So here we have the opcode, the immediate field, which expands these two columns, and the register source, which is the same as the register destination. 
And next we can do a store, same thing. So same address because it's still 880. And now we are storing the contents of register nine into that address. So we have the opcode for that, same as the source for the address and the source for the data. So that's how it would translate, and that's what the compiler would do. So what you would see in ones and zeros would be this. So this is the actual, except that nine there should be zero one zero one zero, okay? So, or I'm sorry, that nine should be zero one zero zero one, just like this one here. So this would be the actual machine code. This would be the actual bits that would be a store in code memory, in program memory, and as the processor is executing this program, it would fetch this instruction, and these fields would tell the actual hardware what it needs to do and uh, to make that operation happen. And that's what we're going to see in chapter four, how we actually implement that hardware. And you're also going to have uh, opportunities to implement hardware like that in the lab. And this is just um, the instructions encoded in hex. So memory. Memory as an abstraction is just a large linear block of storage. You have all kinds of things that you can have in memory. Now this actual memory is not a monolithic um, to, to make the abstraction uh, complete. This memory is not a monolithic uh, piece of hardware, neither physically nor logically. This, is rep this represents a hierarchy. We can have at this view, we have different levels of cache. We have the actual DRAM. We have the disk, the virtual memory that resides in disk. So if you look at your, um, if you look at, at your C drive of your uh, computer, your Windows computer, there is going to be a large file with the, the, the extension sys. So that's a, that's a file that is used as virtual memory because you don't have as much memory in hardware as the processor can address. So you like to give it to the processor anyway and put in there things that are not, that are not being accessed um, so oftenly. So you put it on disk and it, if it does get access, now you have to go to disk and you can see how your computer takes a little while to go and do the swap and uh, bring it into actual hardware memory. So all that mechanism of memory hierarchy we're going to see in chapter five, but the point is that at some level of abstraction, the processor sees a unified data structure or hierarchy that is controlled by different mechanisms, such as the cache hierarchy and the virtual memory. Um, that is uh, that is managed via hardware, mostly uh, at, at the cache level. But for virtual memory, since it um, interacts with the disk, whether it is a solid state uh, disk or not these days, uh, the operating system has a big uh, a big role in managing that. But to the processor is this unified big storage space where you can have everything, you know, your programs, your data, your, all the files, essentially. So the, between some hardware 
in the processor and a lot of the operating system functionality, they manage that abstraction. So for the programs, in instructions is just this ones and zeros, just like data. Somewhere in, in this memory hierarchy could be this, could be DRAM, could be some level of cache, because processors these days have easily three levels. Um, but it's just ones and zeros. Okay. Now, one word about binary compatibility. What makes the difference is if you have programs that adhere to some specific ISA, they have to be run on that processor. Because as we'll see in chapter four, these instructions, these ones and zeros that we saw in the previous slide means something in terms of how the hardware operates. So you cannot, for example, um, you cannot uh, take a program that was compiled for ARM and run it on an Intel processor. You have to recompile it. And hopefully your C code is portable. Uh, so because those ones and zeros, as you saw, because the actual instructions and the instruction formats, they mean something. And we'll see how that drives the hardware later on in chapter four. So keep that in mind uh, as how the, the ISA, part of what we're talking about in this chapter, <clears throat> and the actual instructions standardize that, but only for a processor. So it becomes a very standardized specification and abstraction of what the processor does and how the processor behaves.